Hello everyone, um, very nice to have you here once again, today in a total different format and place. We are here with uh, Carson, a good friend of mine. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, we are here at Sintra actually, and this beautiful place. Um, and uh, today we are talking with Carson. Um, which I actually met uh, some years ago when I studied permaculture and so we are both very passionate about nature and permaculture and regenerative agriculture so I would like to bring today, invite you today Carson to speak a little bit about your experience what uh, made you go to the journey of permaculture and regenerative agriculture why you became so passionate about it. Yeah, I would yeah. like to know, and Thank the you. other people that are listening to us know a little bit more about you and what you were doing. <laughs> so, yes, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure and welcome at my home. This is my, we have a big food forest behind us. Not very big, but small, homestead food forest. Um, who, where should I start? This is a very long journey, actually. Um, it all basically started when I was a little kid, really. Um, from well, I grew up in this house. This was the former market of of Hinshoa, and um, I used to play soccer on this lawn here. <laughs> this was a lawn before, and but since I was a little kid, I always had this tendency of um, play with water look for ants and find ants and collect ants and make a try to make a uh, ant <laughs> colony or uh, collect snakes and uh, snakes sorry not snakes but snails 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 and slugs snakes is dangerous yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and spiders and everything like I would always try and capture an animal and then observe it and and kind of play with it Oh, nice. especially spiders I was always very very inspired by spiders and and see how they they make their webs and everything and so I grew up with uh, at one point my parents they had also bought this little piece of land mm -hmm. and now have two houses on it yeah very nice actually yes. <laughs> and it was just a little forest basically with acacias we actually live on Acacia Avenue, mm -hmm. near the Zagatis, yeah, which is funny, <laughs> um, and um, because I'm very fond of them. Um, and yeah, I spent so much time in that garden, and every time it would rain, I would just put a big coat on, <laughs> and I would only come back into the house when I was completely soaked. <laughs> and um, and I would make rivers with all the water that comes from wow. this house that is behind us here or on the other side of the camera um, like half of the house actually captures 200,000 liters per year so every time there would be big rains all the water would go into that piece of land and then it would flow through the land and I would make little rivers mm -hmm. and make the water go to every plant that I knew was kind of more important there so, um, sorry, I just have to put this off. Um, and so, yeah, basically, that's that was my beginning as a little kid with that continuous interest. I also, when I would have a terrarium or I would have a, an aquarium and I would have fishes and uh, or. Um, I also collected what do you call them? Little um, oh, the little, li little lizards. Yeah, yeah, little lizards. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, this was when I was a little kid, and then you know childhood started, uh, <laughs> and school and education, <laughs> and so as I was very sporty, I had completely different goals for my future. I wanted to be a soccer player. Oh, nice. Yeah, <laughs> we made <And> it. <laughs> And, and I was actually really good at it um, and also in athletism um, but at one point I got hurt and I went to skateboarding and all this stuff and this was then finishing school and then you know that question when finishing school was mm -hmm. always what the <laughs> hell am I gonna do with my life 
and and this kind of took some time for me to to kind of s get to where I am right now. This mm -hmm. was a very long journey. I went to Frankfurt and studied chemistry and and sports to become a teacher. Wow. So I already had that thing of wanting to teach, and I also finished school with chemistry, physics, and and also languages because I went to German school and speak five languages, which is really nice. Um, and um, but yeah, my geeky thing was always <laughs> nature. Yeah, you have a geeky <laughs> thing. <laughs> nature and physics and. You know, I already always really enjoyed that, and actually, because in German school you have this weird system where you have to choose between uh, on only two you can have. Mm -hmm. So I had chemistry, and physics, but I could change to biology or French, or you mm -hmm. know, it's really weird. And I, I would have free classes, and I would go into the biology class <laughs> just to. <laughs> spend time with them yeah. and and just you know learn a little bit more yeah. and, and spend my time within that lesson because not doing nothing was was not worth it for me at that point and I would have fun and I would be you know paying attention to mm -hmm. what they were um, teaching um, and so yeah um, I, I so I was a normal person <laughs> for a long time yeah, until when too. I came I after school I went to Frankfurt but then I was kind of heartbroken from being far away from Portugal and then I came back after two years because I didn't I didn't manage to stay there um, I came back studied tourism but then on the second year of tourism something happened um, we went out for dinner on a, we went to eat sushi yeah. but we went into a library before and my father saw a book about bonsais oh. and he gave me that book because I was so fascinated b about it and um, yeah actually when I was a little kid I had lots of books about nature animals and stuff like that yeah, but also the geeky persons of plants <laughs> also plants and one of the fascinating things was actually bonsais and um, so this was kind of the trigger to reconnect with nature and its pattern Mm -hmm. Because bonsai is very, very much about trees and how they, they have this dendritic pattern, that you know bifurcation, 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 yeah, uh, fractal. Uh, and so, this was then a new discovery, and I have this tendency. But you when had I that perception of the pattern in that already in that looking at the bonsai, it, it already triggered your mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a. I'm very visual, so I I, ha I always had that thing with, and actually I remember I at arts class, on the fourth grade, we had to paint a tree, or not paint but, uh, s like skids, uh, like yeah, yeah, draw, like draw, uh, yeah, just a simple drawing, just with pencil, and I managed to make a tree, just by. You know going like this and then dividing and then dividing and yeah. then dividing and it's all all actually that simple uh, of a pattern and then at the end it looks really like mm -hmm. a tree and i was like wow <laughs> i painted that um so this was interesting that experience as a kid and then kind of made sense after a while to recognize this in in the bonsais and and um and then later on while after having found out about permaculture, it made so total sense to have this, you know, this yeah. these divisions. How you fractals. how you crossed the, how you knew about permaculture and what made you go along with it and also with the, this kind of agriculture that is more connected with nature. How how yeah, it it continued on from the bonsais. I start with bonsai, start digging out trees and little bushes all over the place and <laughs> you know, collecting plants and, and, and reproducing plants and stuff like that. And then I started, oh well I could grow some you know, some parsley or some lettuce or some some vegetables and started doing my first experimentations. I still bought a bag of blue blau can <laughs> from Bayer <laughs> because I didn't know anything about the uh, like uh, soil and you know by bi the biology of the soil and the soil food web and so 
yeah, I started just just propagating some plants, putting some order in the in the garden. That now the one that actually has the ducks the ducks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ducks. I saw the ducks. <laughs> Not the, the ducks, ducks. The ducks. <laughs> the ducks in. Doug is actually a good friend of ours. Yeah, Doug it Crouch, was my teacher from permaculture. Bye to Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was actually the first garden that I started, uh, my first gardening experiences. And so, yeah, um, it's, uh, are you going to jump on my lap, right? Hi, little chicken. <laughs> it's copy. Um, so, yeah, that was the first garden. And then at... When, when it was, I think it was with Sepp Holzer mm -hmm. um, and my mom all of a sudden, uh, yeah, she, I also had this book by John Seymour mm -hmm. of living on the land, um, mm -hmm. you know, self-sustainability and so on as a kid. As a kid, wow. As a kid I had that book. And then, yeah, my mom, she realized that she had that book by Sepp Holzer about you know the Akarabel, the, mm -hmm. the agrarian r rebel. Oh my God! If yeah. you speak German, we have to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> and so these were all like signs about things that were already in my vicinity. You know, mm -hmm. like I started attracting these things into my into my life, and and so they appeared. And then we had Tamera, and I went to Tamera for the first weekend, and then later on I inscribed in the course with Sepulso. And oh, you really did the course with it? Yeah, yeah, the water, restore, water yeah. restoring water landscapes and so on. And this was actually where I met Doug for the first yeah. time in Gautier. They were doing with the hand. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so, and I met Pedro as well from Terra Alta. And then it all just collapsed uh, together into one thing, which then went to the first permaculture course and uh, me taking the course being with Doug and we connecting very deeply and also with with Pedro Valju from Terra Alta um, and um, yeah, and then from then on we, we stayed in touch and I started transforming my garden I started here my first banana circles I think you might see banana here <laughs> um, I don't see <laughs> and so yeah and so then what you learn about permaculture what made you connect with permaculture, what, to, what bring value to you permaculture at that time? Uh, one of the most astonishing things, I actually with permaculture it started with with more like Masanobu Fukuoka inspired mm -hmm. agriculture, yeah. like synergistic agriculture because yeah. I was already studying agriculture in ISA, mm -hmm. Institut Superior de Agronomia. Mm -hmm. And I looked for videos on the internet and YouTube had started already and I found synergistic agriculture with Emilia Hazelip, which then led to permaculture and then I got in touch with Pedro and, and then later we met in Tamera. So what it had taught me and the most astonishing thing at the beginning was like that regarding soils, supposedly in agriculture, um, the fertility is exponential. Hmm. That actually, the after harvest, you should actually have a, a higher fertility than before. Than before, yeah. The harvest, it's and that totally different natural thing that ecosystems actually work in that way. And basically, the energy that is always available is the sunlight, mm -hmm. right? And then with the water and the water cycle and the mineral cycle and all these different things. Um, they will contribute to then higher fertility, deeper soils, more organic matter, um, and 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 then the cycle repeats. Mm -hmm. right? More plants, more food for everything that is walking on the earth, and then stuff going back into the soil and the cycle repeating mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So, and this was like an explosion in my head. <laughs> Because it, it, it's, we were so limited before, you know, like before understanding how nature really works, it was really just some limited m and scarcity mindset, I think. Um, obviously, this is another part of my life that I have only started realizing like three years ago for myself. Um, but regarding nature, this, this, 
this was really just that connection and that also everything is connected. So how are you connected also with the what you learn with permaculture and looking at the patterns? Because permaculture is about observing the patterns of nature and try to work with nature ag in s instead of against the nature and compe competing with nature. And yeah. actually, one of the things that we do. So, what kind of thing that uh, actually you embody and you learn from permaculture that you, b you embody to your own self and your own development, how you connected and how the how you came across to even do it, wanted to do more. Oh, hello! <laughs> oh, you see how nature is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it like this way. <laughs> you see, oh, she no, you can see just it. came across to be with me right now. Yeah. So, whew, this is a very deep question, actually. Um, it's more like what I n know now and feel now is that nature is actually the teacher. Mm -hmm. and that you have that you always have that image on <laughs> you always have that image about <laughs> in the permaculture designers manual where you see the m many different trees and you see the cycles acting like this and then you have the person here and then it's written system acts as a teacher and that you get into understanding nature by through protracted and thoughtful observation so basically it's it's us observing and understanding because the things are all in front of us mm -hmm. right and and actually one of the funny things that I do when I teach mm -hmm. food forest or memory composting or whatever you can explain to people a little bit with food forest because food some, forest. some people don't know what food it is, forest so. is is like a, a system or an e a forest ecosystem that contains many edible species um, and and um, Oops. <laughs> disturbance <laughs> um, so it's it's a it basically it's a forest, but and and you have all the different layers of the forest uh, fulfilled, and um, it's fulfilled with all the different needs that you have in life: uh, food, medicine, um, fiber, mm -hmm. resources, building material, and so on. And um, you imitate how the forest works, and and you have it with your needs fulfilled through it so yeah um but one of the things that i do when i teach food forest mm -hmm. is i ask people about um i ask them to make a visualization which is they close their eyes and they i tell them to visualize the word nature and when they open their eyes i ask them how many people have you seen on that picture and so I'm gonna take this away now um, and usually people have not seen any human on that picture oh really yes which means that we have actually taken ourselves out of the context out of the, out of the picture yes. <laughs> yes and so what permaculture has, has taught me is that for us to heal ourselves because nature has not <laughs> any kind of problem we need to we need to like be part of the system again um, and integrate ourselves into the system again mm -hmm. and and this is this is a nut job for my, for most people no. because there's a big disconnection happen. Disconnection. Yeah. yeah. Happening right now. Or ha has been happening for a long time and people are realizing now many are kind of waking up and realizing that this is the connection that is missing that our nature is to be in nature and our nature is not only inside of us and we, we have all the different patterns within us um, but like we have to be part of it again mm -hmm. and 
this separation from us to nature is what has actually brought so many problems up. Mm -hmm. It's the disconnection of our own self. Yeah. And um, Alan Watts actually talks about <coughs> how we have the inner organs mm -hmm. and how they work and they sustain our life, mm -hmm. but we also have the outer organs and That's the that produce okay. that produce um, oxygen and they sustain our lives mm -hmm. with the food that we take, with the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. Mm -hmm. and, and this understanding of outer organs and inner organs is actually the loop that we are missing mm -hmm. um, in our belief system and in our notion about what we are and who we are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, one of the things that the Marna Vida is ab about and once it's part of the purpose is to actually go along with re re this term again that's regeneration and yeah. uh, in some kind of way you can explain it's connected with holistic management yeah. Uh, maybe, and I know that you participated in our last conference that was about co-creating a regenerative world that actually I think that we are wanting to be catalysts of that. Mm -hmm. So what do you can tell us to the public, what actually is regeneration for you and the connection between holistic management that I know also that's a part of your yeah. passions right now Yeah. and actually how can people actually be also contributing to be regenerators itself and yeah. what's this all about? Yeah, I think the, the term regeneration came out of frustration because <laughs> sustainability was, was not enough. working. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and, and I think it's important to understand what, what actually now that we are also very friends or we like uh, neurolinguistic pattern uh, yeah. um, neurolinguistic programming, programming very much um, sustaining is keeping things Think the same, same way. way and so if something is sustainable it's not really supposed to change exactly <laughs> and we wanted to have something and we talked a lot about sustainability while we were in a big mess <laughs> and we actually needed to regenerate <laughs> the big mess that we have and that we are in mm -hmm. to to uh, to um, make things better again mm -hmm. so and regeneration now basically is we have lost a lot of soil and we need to regenerate the soils so that and I always do like this because <laughs> yeah, then this should be that thick at least um, and have five percent organic matter um, to to have fertility in the soils again so that we have plants that have the adequate nutrition and animals can be fed and people can be fed with the fruit or animals with the fruit and everything so like the whole ecosystem actually is a system that builds soil so that life can create better conditions for more life hmm. so and a forest grows on a fallen forest um, you know ecosystems are always evolving um, becoming better and better and better and be and in kind of in an exponential way um, like I said in the beginning mm -hmm. you know uh, we had probably some places on planet earth that were like two meters of topsoil yeah and everything is washed away and um, and agriculture has basically treated nature like it was an, uh, a commodity and a resource that is finite and we just extract everything and now we are realizing that we're <laughs> you know we're getting out of uh, we're uh, you know nature is degrading we don't have enough oxygen production probably mm -hmm. at one point mm -hmm. um, everything is polluted uh, things are getting more and more desertified. We have kind of the desert coming into mm -hmm. um, the peninsula, uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. It's the other way around, um, and and things are getting worse. We have wildfires, which makes things even worse. And so 
we have more and more space in between the plants and this is one of the things that Ashley Alan Savory talks a lot about um, and we need to reverse this whole process now one of the things that happens and this is one of the uh, I, I told you before uh, we were not recording um, is I always thought that the in reversal of desertification is reforestation, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's not. It's not only. Oh, okay. It's not only. Yes. Because in actually, in fact, the deserted uh, deserted places in the planet, it they were forests before the majority. Not of only. It, not only. Okay. Yes, not only. So one of the what I think and actually the other day I listened to a podcast that was about holistic management and what they call the forest was a charismatic mega flora so there is you know trees are charismatic mega flora yes but they like <laughs> that we they take all the attention because trees are beautiful and like the bonsais you know they have a beautiful pattern and you see stuff outside here and they're really big and you know sequoias can be a hundred mm -hmm. meters high and I don't know like <laughs> as thick as almost this part of the house or something like this right but and it's a process and things that you see outside happening but um, they take a very long time to reach maturity um, and in the middle of all of this uh, while they're growing they're probably not the most productive ones in carbon sequestration wow yes so and what happens is most of the carbon is probably outside obviously the root system is really big but there's somebody or there's an ecosystem that I believe is more productive and much quicker in carbon sequestration which is prairies okay yes why is that why do you think that because you have a much greater density of plants the plants they grow much quicker they the whole the whole um, area that they will like the actually two-thirds of planet earth like i said before mm -hmm. supposedly so the deserts that we have right now two-thirds of planet earth were uh, prairies mm -hmm. with great amounts of herds herding animals mm -hmm. in their predator herd relationship mm -hmm. and they became deserts through humans mm -hmm. oh really most probably yes Even the, through the, the hunting the middle, through the middle herd. east ones even the, the yes, Middle like East Yes, like you mean like a, like like uh, Saudi, Ara uh, Saudi Arabia, things like that. Yes, yes, like the whole thing, and then into Asia, until like Los Plateau or something mm -hmm, like that, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the Mojave Desert, mm -hmm. and then you have, I think, in the south of, of uh, South America, you also have. Mm -hmm. So, and and so. What I have understood is that all of these were prairies and that they had many, many herding animals, but really in, in amount of animals that we cannot really imagine. Wow. Um, and we had many different species there as well. Um, m like one of the pictures that always comes in my head is, you know, Lion King? <laughs> Yeah. I love you remember that Lion King? Movie, so. <laughs> so you see that picture where you have the elephants mm. and you have the 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 buffaloes yeah, and you the have zebras the and zebras <laughs> and all of these animals and these are all ruminants mo most of them zebras not uh, they're like horses they're not ruminants but most of these animals are are ungulates like they have two nails or oh yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like um, uh, buffaloes no, the, the simple ones are the cow <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> sheep and the goats <laughs> right yeah. and so they well, have the always two nails like this Yes, and and so yeah, the buffaloes and uh, wildebeest and all mm -hmm. these different kinds of animals that you that you have. If you go into the states, into the uh, uh, North North America, you have the bison. Yeah. But from wow. what I know, I think they had like um, also megafauna, like they had many different other ruminants there as well. 
you have the um, uh, what do you call it the viados. What do you say viados again? Deers. Deer. You have deer. You have also um, the uh, moose. moose. Yeah, moose. The moose. Yeah, I think I so. Think so. Yeah. <laughs> So, so. M m many of these animals are ruminants, and um, so and you had them in much bigger numbers. And mm -hmm. um, from what I have read about the bisons, they had them in the mi millions, you know, like wow. giant herds of animals, and they would move in packs um, because they always were careful with the pre the, the, the predators. Um, and so there's they have evolved with the prairie and the prairie with them mm -hmm. with their predators as well so there is this bigger symbiosis or symbiosis that we were not aware of mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and this is all based on the work of uh, Ellen Savory with holistic management because they in Africa they had actually killed I think like 20,000 elephants or something like yeah. that yeah. because they thought that the animals were, were killing the, the ecosystem yes exactly like they were accelerating uh, deforestation and after killing all these animals deforestation actually got worse yeah we have a kind of tendency to do those kind of yeah. things yeah well <laughs> and and Alan Savory like I've feel him man like <laughs> <laughs> I think he was very sorry about this and this is the reason why he why he continued his work um, because he really um, wanted to to do something good and he did what all the scientists do they proved their case and um, then politicians politicians they agreed and then we have to kill so yeah. many animals yeah. and and now an ele elephants from what i know i think are ruminants as well i'm not sure um but um so yeah they killed a lot of animals and they realized that it even got worse and one of the things that you actually see in and especially in the states in natural reserves where they have taken all the ruminants and all these animals herding animals from the land that it got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, it, we don't really understand how nature works. I think we have th this yes. kind of mindset that we think that we, how we manage is the right thing to do it, but yeah. actually n nature knows it better. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if the animals were there, they were supposed to yeah. live there in balance. They know how to balance. That's the thing that we've forgotten in the yeah. middle of all this. So. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> it's that thing you know yeah, yeah. it's that myopia because or it's what the separate it part of it the, the thing yeah. that you you talk about i think it's what it, we talk about in generation is that we disconnect so we think that we are separate from nature and we know better yeah. instead how david uh, attenborough say uh, instead of us working against nature we have work with nature and understand deep you, you said nature is our teacher we are uh, and it's difficult for us in our human yeah. side our egoistic side the ego side uh, uh, actually here that nature knows it better than we know yeah because we still think that we are separate from that yeah um, there's this really nice song that I like by this <laughs> uh, artist not, uh, called Spangle and the song says or the title is nothing is something worth doing wow <laughs> yeah but i think at this moment we cannot do nothing i think so we what really do you think we can do i think we need to imitate nature with the animals that we already have and that we can feed ourselves from and which is a very sensitive uh subject i think because many people still think that we should not use animals for this. So how? Now <laughs> I'm going to ask a tricky question. I know that you were a vegan. So how a vegan person at this moment is a person that can tell me this? How did you go to the process? Or <laughs> not, not explain the process, but in a way that you, you can being peace with yourself by saying that actually we can manage and 
work with animals in this way and uh, that's indeed we are all one so what do you have to <laughs> so yeah um what she probably wants to say is that <laughs> i am on a carnivore diet <laughs> no i just <laughs> so i was vegan before i was vegan for three and a half years um so i will leave the whole um, health aspects on the side yeah. for now and just concentrate on the because ecosystemic the part. Yeah, the connection. Between. So, uh, to be honest, um, and this might be very straightforward for many people, um, I which that. is, <laughs> I don't think veganism is doing anything for the environment. Mm -hmm. um, I love because your <laughs> Because what is being done we're saving some animals and this is beautiful I like it but there's something bigger than just a few animals um, and I, I realize that it's not only a few it's actually many but the thing is that if first two-thirds of the planet is desert and it was prairies before so these are man-made deserts and um, they became deserts because of a lack of proper management and also because the animals start disappearing and the predators also start disappearing because obviously if you live with a predator close by like a tiger <laughs> you will probably feel much safer if, if he was dead right so this is one part but um, then the other part is actually 60% of agricultural land or land that could be uh, like 60 percent of land that could be used for food production cannot be used for conventional agriculture so it's really difficult to plant something there and this land was would be more useful for as prairie mm -hmm. and again as a, like pasture um, so this is one part and I think it was the same thing as we said before i was not seeing the bigger picture which is the whole ecosystemic part like when you have i think now that when you have a culture unless you have it on a small scale like this food forest and um, you have many things mixed in with uh, each other um, so that you increase diversity so that you have ecological stability so that you don't have diseases on plants um, like this is the only way that this would work but you know like you would not be effective or efficient for bigger scale production like we need nowadays mm -hmm. for how many billion people do we have seven, seven point yeah something so mm -hmm. uh, which then brings the question like how would we be able to produce bigger amounts for example gourget or i don't know bananas mm -hmm. um, and this is then through monocultures mm -hmm. you can have slight polycultures like mm -hmm. i don't know like two species three species maximum because at one point it starts losing efficiency because you're spreading out yourself to think these are actually <laughs> papagais. The, really? The, the wild, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> papagais. Yeah. Um, so you will spread out yourself too thin regarding your production. And as a producer, it's much easier to have just one crop. But, mm -hmm. but if you want to have just one crop, you need a big field for that. And so you have to put the ecosystem on the side so that you have that one crop mm -hmm. and it can be organic and everything but, but this ecosystem will not, not be the same and it's not regenerative. And, and it's not regenerative yes so what what happens then is um, and this is just a few crops right and you want to have many different crops uh, for food production for planet earth and and so on the other side, cattle, even though they might be grain finished, which means at the end of their life cycle, they go into feedlots and they are fed like hormones uh, and stuff like that. grain, grain yeah. right? Um, they spend 80, 
85, I think, or 80% to 90% on of their life on pasture, you're still probably doing better for the environment than with having, you know, a monoculture of courgettes or bananas, mm -hmm. for example. And what you kill is just one of the animals that was on that field. Mm -hmm. And now depends depending on the management, and this is where this there's a TED talk called "It's not the cow, it's the how." <laughs> uh, depending on the management, this land will be able to harbor more animals that belong to that ecosystem than a field of courgette or bananas. So obviously now, if you want to increase that and make something better, like doing the holistic management approach. Um, you will imitate how these animals, cows, sheep, or goats, act on uh, in, in, yeah. or act in an ecosystem as a herd with predator-prey relationship. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually the natural relationship yes. that and, existed. And this is what you do through holistically planned grazing, because holistic exactly. management is not animal husbandry. Animal husbandry is part of holistic management um, and so how whew, this is intense. <laughs> <laughs> I just have uh, to explain we don't have to go deep on this it's yeah, just an expo simple explanation if, if you do if you imitate how animals act in that way they are packed all together they poop and pee where they <laughs> eat so that they have to move because this land will they don't eat where they have mm -hmm. fouled the land fouled is they put their feces on it um, and they won't go back into that piece of land for a while until all the stuff that they have put on it and trampled and so on um, is gone and in the soil and plants are coming back mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. and what happens a lot is you have overgrazing because animals stay too long on a piece of land and they eat the same plant too often so that it actually have to lose some of its root system to mm -hmm. regenerate mm -hmm. right and what you want to have is just uh, not eat too much of the plants but with so many animals packed all together with all the manure that goes on that mm -hmm. land the and with the right recovery time for that plants of that pasture um, it will recover much better mm -hmm. Now the behavior of the animal is is very important and the timing of how long the f animals are on that land is also very important. Mm -hmm. So you want to have the right amount of animals for the right amount of time with the right behavior for the right reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you move on to the next piece of land. Mm -hmm. So but you, what you do is you actually increase density of the animals. and so forth so this is a very long subject and i'm al already going a little bit deeper into it but yeah um i'm right now besides the whole health thing that has become much better for me with that diet i'm more inclined to give favor to eating animals than uh, supporting the <laughs> the destruction of ecosystems through monocultures of yeah. for food production. Because the thing is not doing, or it's how we kill the animals actually. That yes. If you kill the animals in the right way yes. and you balance the things, sort it out, yeah. it's not a question of being vegan or not. It's actually being in the holistic way that we human beings were but in in harmony with things so yeah. i think that's the message that you are yes and and um one part that i think is really important is when these animals exist in herds in a predator prey relationship the lions and the hyenas and all these that hunt them mm -hmm. they will only eat the weak ones yeah and this is actually what the word culling that they call for killing the animal but a specific one that you have taken out mm -hmm. the culling is actually like what are the cows that have more flies on them this is one that I you take out go. the one that has longer legs because it's longer legs are probably not the best this is the one that you take out and you always keep the best of these animals to reproduce, reproduce. you keep the best bulls they have the 
the best body for what you also want to have and for their health. And what did you frack it? Shit! <laughs> Is it still recording? I think so. Still recording? Yeah, I'm yes. almost finishing, so. Yeah. <laughs> She's sitting here with me. Um, <laughs> so you always choose the weakest animals. You do always take the ones that are the weakest in terms of health, in terms of, you know, their body and and how they how they act and like do you want to keep the smartest ones the strongest ones the ones that are the best mothers and so on so you continue exactly that process of pre a predator prey relationship yeah and you contribute to this the genes of that animals uh, whatever it is cows sheep or goats for example to be the best um, and and you contribute to their species actually mm -hmm. with choosing always the worst genes out mm -hmm. and keeping the best. The best, yeah. You know, and I think this is really crucial to understand that, like, if you would, the thing that is happening with humans right now is mm -hmm. we're saving every human. <laughs> Exactly, Which is it's sick. insane. It's, it's insane. Just insane. And so, yeah. you know, like humans are not even able to give birth by themselves. Yeah, so, it's an what insane the hell? thing. That's why we have yeah. seven point yes. something billion of people. And, and I think with humans, actually, the same would happen in the past. Like, if you would try and hunt these animals, like the weakest ones would probably yeah. not eat. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it would be eaten by a lion or something. Yeah. It's another <laughs> so it's yeah. a totally thing that we have to rethink all this. So yeah. So actually Carson, in a way you help uh, this uh, kind of uh, doing your course uh, doing courses about these things and also um, you can also give some consultancy regarding these things if you want you can explain a little bit to, uh, because of the work that Carson actually does and i think for now we even we are with low battery and it's the purpose is to have a little bit of a conversation here with carson that he did yeah, he will we have, have opportunity half an hour yeah <laughs> he will have opportunity to give us a little bit more of his experience it's a it's a wikipedia actually <laughs> so <laughs> so we will have a lot to to talk with Carson in the near future also and um, and we thank you so much once again it's totally different format thank you so much Carson for